Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 12063 Advanced Statutory Interpretation and Drafting. This is week one of 2018 and tonight we're dealing with the topic of objectives and outcomes of statutory drafting. This unit is one that was developed uh, and promoted by Dr. Maranak. I'm taking the unit this year. I have big shoes to, to fill. Um, but the materials are largely provided by Dr. Maranak and the assessment regime is that which was developed by Dr. Maranak in previous offerings of this unit. So as I said, I've got big shoes to fill. Um, but thank you for joining us and those that have joined us live, thank you. Those that are watching the recorded session, please consider joining us live on Tuesday evenings at seven o'clock in the future. Usual ground rules apply. If you're asking a question, please unmute your microphone or use the chat facility and I would like to encourage discussion. I, uh, before commencing the recording, I warned the participants that if they don't ask questions, then um, there's a very real risk that I'll just keep talking. So uh, they are duly warned. This unit is, I think, an excellent unit for a number of reasons. The first is, that we have a small cohort. So we have a great opportunity to collaborate, um, not just in small study groups, but as a, a total group. And you probably are aware, those that have worked with me in the past, that I encourage a good deal of um, collaboration. Now that's not collusion, but collaboration is genuine opportunity to encourage each other, learn from each other, and to assist each other. Um, shortly, I'll show you U-Crew. I, I think that that's a good platform for advancing that, um, uh, those, those goals. Another reason that I think this unit is very good is that it's very practically orientated. Now, practically orientated, perhaps in a very precise and uh, um, defined manner, but still it's a very practical uh, unit. I particularly like being given the opportunity to coordinate this unit because again those that have worked with me in the past are aware that I am very keen on using appropriate grammar. I like uh, precision in the work that you produce. I like work that is of a professional standard. So in introduction to law I gave myself some license to correct people in terms of their grammar, their presentation, and general construction of sentences. If you've worked with me in the past, you'll know that I favor, generally speaking, the use of short sentences written in the active voice um, in ensuring that it is grammatically correct and that there is a good uh, spelling um, and that and the document works. So they're all things that I use in introduction to law. I then don't, um, Previously, I don't then advance those sorts of issues in later subjects, um, but this one, I have a chance to come back and deal with those issues about presentation, grammar, and the appropriate manner of drafting. So in that sense, it's a, a unit that is well suited to my style. So we have 12 weeks of content. This is a very unusual unit in the sense of the assessment and the reading. It's not a matter of taking 12 chapters from a 12 chapter textbook and working week by week through one chapter through to the next, as is the case in some of the units, certainly some of the units that I've coordinated. So here we have two primary reference books. One is prescribed, the other is supplementary, but you can probably tell from the extent of reading referred to in the supplementary text that it would be wise to get both. So let's have a look at those textbooks um, from the outset. <clears throat> Hopefully you have at least one, but possibly and um, preferably both. The first is Pierce and Geddes, Statutory Interpretation in Australia. And you will find that much of the material covered in this text was covered in Statutory Interpretation the textbook there was Sanson's um, textbook. So this is quite a, uh, a thick textbook. It's quite detailed. It's beautifully written. It's very well resourced. It is extremely authoritative in terms of its content. So um, that's a LexisNexis publication. 
I really like this textbook. Um, it's a must. The other one that I think is just terrific, and I, if you get this and you follow it, you are going to excel in practice. It is worth getting. Um, and this is the complete guide to English usage for Australian students. Now, it's not specifically designed for law students, but if you want some great techniques from an easily read book about how you should write, then get this one. Um, and I adopt much, if not all, of what has been said in this excellent textbook by Margaret Ramsey. Now, there are many other good textbooks that you can consider. You may already have, and I suspect you do have, the prescribed text from Statutory Interpretation, and that's an excellent text. That is uh, Statutory Interpretation by Michelle Sanson. Another one that I think is really worth having a look at is Modern Legal Drafting, a Guide to you Using Clearer Language by Peter Butt. So this is an excellent text. Again, it's easily read and um, worth considering. Uh, it's a Cambridge Press publication. So there are a few others that we might refer to as we progress, but that's an overview of the textbooks that I think um, are worth having in any event and certainly will assist you in terms of this unit. All right, now do we have any questions? No questions. If you have any questions, please unmute, ask the question. Um, but let's go in and have a look at the assessment overview. I think you know, if you've worked with me in the past, that my philosophy, um, and I have a few philosophies, I appreciate that, but one of my philosophies is, let's have a look at what we wish to achieve ultimately and work back from that. We have here three assessment pieces. The first one is the simulated cabinet submission. The second is the legislative drafting assignment. And the third is participation. So we'll look at those in details, but um, let's have a look at where you will find that information. To do that, I'm going to share the screen and we'll go to the Moodle site. Now, with any luck, and please tell me if this is the case, or if it's not the case, you should see the Moodle site for this unit. I'm sure by this stage, you're all very familiar with you, uh, with Moodle. Um, I have a particular way that I like to set out my Moodle sites. Please give me some feedback as to whether you like the way that I set out Moodle, and uh, I'm always keen to improve. My philosophy with Moodle is to try and limit it to the basic information. And again, I try to practice what I preach in terms of a writing style using relatively short sentences written in the active voice. In terms of the layout, you'll see the top left hand corner, we have the assessment items, the link to those assessment items, and um, below the commentary on the landing page, of course, the link to tonight's Zoom lecture, Ucrew class discussion, news forum, which is really for me, and then below that, a number of um, pages or uh, labels for which you to consider. You'll see that a couple of new plagiarism, academic misconduct, useful tips, learning support are, are new, um, which lead me then to assessments. And um, that's what we'll look at shortly. But before I do, I just want to confirm that this is the link here to you crew class discussion. I need to emphasize that because it seems that no one has been to the you crew class discussion, at least as far as I can tell. Let me stop the share and everyone saw that was the Moodle site. I got that, I got the technology right there. Uh, let's go to Moodle, uh, from Moodle to Ucrew. And uh, again, I'll share the screen to that effect. Okay, so now you should see the Moodle, the Ucrew site. So you follow the link, which is on the landing page on Moodle, to find yourself here at Ucrew. If you've worked with me in the past, this will be very familiar. The layout of Ucrew is a little different though. And you'll see on the left-hand side, my subjects. I have many subjects. There's land law, for example. Some of you might be doing land law with me as well. So the same thing. So we've got a number of people that are active in terms of discussions in, say, land law. 
Likewise, alternative dispute resolution I'm taking, and we've got a lot of discussion going on in ADR. But what we're here tonight is to do with advanced statutory interpretation and drafting. And if we look at that page, there's me making an, an announcement um, of welcome and an invitation for you to introduce yourself. So nothing there at this stage. So let's see if we can correct that and um, have you start to become more active in terms of you crew. Now, any questions, any problems associated with getting to you crew? All good? All right. John, uh, it's Greg speaking. Hi, How Greg. Are you? I'm fine. Thank uh, you. I will talk to the university IT unit. I've never used you crew and get some advice and try and make a contribution very quickly. All right. Now, that's good. Um, it should just be, and you can even check this now, if you've got Moodle on, on site, you should be able to just follow the link and go straight through. Um, as from yesterday, I made sure that everyone enrolled in the unit had access to you crew and it should just be a matter of following the link. So do you have the Moodle page available to you at the moment, Greg? All right, but if you have any problems, anyone? Yes, John, I do. I'm going to have a crack at it now. Okay, just just click the link and it should take you through. Have have others? Um, so Siobhan says should be should be easy. It's easy to use. I know Adam, Neil, you've used this. Haley, you've used it before, I think. Um, if you have any problems, please send me an email. And generally speaking, if you have any questions, comments, or contributions, please consider using you crew. So while Gregory is checking that, let's share the screen again and have a look at the assessment pieces. I'm going to start with the third assessment, which might seem a bit odd because it's um, a bit different this time. Let's see if we can find the third assessment piece. All right, participation. <clears throat> I've not ever coordinated a unit where we have participation as, a, um, as an assessment piece. But given the nature of the two first assessments, which combined make up 85%, we need something to fill the extra 15% and we need something that I'll hold back to the end of term. So this is participation. Now there's no, what I have in mind for this is that by Thursday the 11th of October, you upload a Word document that if you like reflects your level of participation in this unit. What I would like you to do is to provide the document. Oops, oh, sorry, I may have lost you there. No, still there. Um, what I'd like you to do is to upload the Word document which reflects what you have done by way of participation during the unit. It's a good way for you to reflect on what you've done to consolidate in one document what you've done. And certainly from my perspective, it makes it easier to mark. The last day for submission is Sunday the 14th of October. That's three days only after the due date. If you don't submit by Thursday the 11th, you'll lose 5% per day for each day of late submission. I expect, however, that almost everyone will submit probably well before the 11th of October. There's no need to leave the submission to the last date. So if you're progressively contributing, participating in the unit, if you're uploading materials or questions, if you're contributing in terms of other um, ways, then you can incorporate that into a Word document and then upload that whenever you like. But do it before the 11th of October um, in order not to suffer a penalty. Do it before the 14th of October in order to um, gain some marks. I will be quite comfortable in awarding 15 out of 15 for this exercise. Likewise, I'll be quite comfortable in awarding zero out of 15. I won't be afraid to mark to the extremities on this one. You can apply for an extension, but it's unlikely you'll get it, particularly given the nature of the task and the fact that I'm releasing it on the first day of term and uh, explaining it during this first week. Now there's no prescribed format for this Word document. 
come up with something that you like and include in that your a copy, if you like, um, of your contributions. It's almost a cut and paste. So if you provide an answer to a weekly problem, then incorporate that into the Word document that reflects your level of participation. Have a look at the rubric. You'll see that um, there are a number of things that I'm looking for. I'm looking for you to self-assess that you have undertaken the prescribed reading and supplementary material. Now, you may come back and say, I read 80% of the material that was prescribed and I read nothing of the supplementary material. So it's a declaration that you make, that you incorporate into your participation document. Likewise, with attending the live Zoom sessions or the lectures or later viewing the lectures, I'm not going to monitor it. I'm going to rely on your declaration. If you declare that you didn't attend any live sessions, but you viewed all of the sessions, um, all of the lectures, then you self-assess, you make a declaration of that effect, and I will mark accordingly. Likewise, um, attendances or reading other than prescribed. So if you read something which is not prescribed or supplementary material, it's not part of the material that I upload in um, Moodle, but it's something worthwhile that goes towards this subject, towards this unit. You can record that. And if you like, if it's an article, for example, you can provide a link to external materials that is where relevant. Now, it may well be that this, these external materials where you provide a link, uh, you incorporate as part of um, something uh, in Ucrew, where you announce to others that you've found this and it's, you've found it useful. So you would copy and paste that into your contribution or your participation document, if you like. Likewise, contributions to class discussions. So if you um, provide something, some contribution in Ucrew, if you provide an answer to a weekly problem, please cut, paste that into a suitable heading into your participation document. And then I'll mark it in terms of the level that you appear to have understood the subject matter your communication skills, your problem identification and problem solving skills, and professional presentation. So what I'm looking for you to do in this exercise is to um, uh, come up with some way of showing that you have produced a product that is professionally presented, included appropriate links, you've identified issues in an articulate manner, You've presented um, the document well. And what I'm looking for you to do is initiate discussion, actively elaborate on other students' discussions, and I do value the contribution of students who build on the ideas and contributions of others. So that is essentially what we're looking for, what I'm looking for you to do in that exercise. I hope it makes some sense. So it's only 15%. You can easily pass the course and still get a good score if you choose to not submit anything for participation. But I hope that you do. And it's a way of us continuing to, to have some momentum in this unit because there is no final exam, there's no final take home paper. So I need to have some way of engaging with you. Otherwise, there's a very real risk that we would simply go off, do our two, ass two assessment pieces and not engage with, e with each other or with me. I hope that makes some sense. Are there any questions about the participation part of the assessment? Or have I explained it reasonably well? All good? Okay. Let's have a look at the other assessment pieces. Assessment one, and you probably got it up on the screen, so I won't necessarily just share it with you, but assessment one, and two work together. One flows on from the other. So what we're looking for you to do is to prepare a mock cabinet submission as part of assessment number one. It's worth 35%. And you identify an area of law that is in your view unjust or inefficient or ambiguous or in need of reform. I don't care what it is. It can be state, it can be federal. 
it can be statute based, it can be common law based. So hopefully there's something that really means something to you that is an important area of practice and you think that there's room for reform. Have a look at the sample document that um, Dr. Maranak prepared, which is excellent. That gives you a really good idea of what this is all about. And what you're trying to do is choose an area of law that should be amended by statute, not through delegated legislation. The second assessment is worth 50%. It flows on. So now you produce the draft speech, which is to be the second reading speech, in relation to the legislation that you have essentially created. You create the legislation by a bill, which is ready to be tabled in Parliament, and you supplement that with an explanatory memorandum, explaining each one of the sections in the legislation that you draft, um, so that you, you explain the mischief that you wish to correct by the bill, the approaches that you've considered, the approach that you have chosen, and the reason why you chose that approach, and then identify any risks or drawbacks associated with that um, legislation. So there are some, some word limits um, in relation to the exercise, otherwise it's fairly open to you. So what you can see here is that in this course, this unit rather, we're adopting an approach that the best way to understand statutory interpretation is to create legislation or to create a statute. Everything okay? All right, and um, Gregory says, I got into you crew, all in, so that's great. Thank you very much. So I'm pleased about that, Gregory, it should be. Any questions about the assessment? Have you all had a chance to read the assessment? John, it's Greg. Yes, yeah, Greg. I, I, I have. Um, I, I've got an idea that I'd like to talk about. It revolves around the uh, Acquisition of Land Act. Uh, I work in property in the Queensland Government. And if you look at it compared to legislation that's just recently been reformed in New South Wales with their Just Terms Compensation Act, um, I think there's suggestions that I could make um, that would prompt my colleagues uh, at work. And I, I think I'd like to uh, do something in that approach, uh, you know, consulting with yourself, of course. But um, that, that's where I'd, I'd like to go. I discussed this with Dr. Maranak uh, last term and um, he thought it was a great idea, but I, I haven't had a chance to talk to you about it till tonight. No, that's terrific. And uh, certainly, um, you know, advance those views through you crew as well. Um, I think it's a great yes, idea. Will. We have the um, um, the compensation power built into the constitution at a Commonwealth level, but we don't have that in the state um, constitution. So there's certainly some room to to look at the way in which uh, land is compulsorily acquired in at a state level. So that's a great idea. Does anyone, while we're on that topic, does anyone else have any ideas? Has anyone looked at the assessment? So, hi, John. It's Siobhan. Hi, Siobhan. Hi, hi Siobhan. Well, um, I've got two ideas that I'm playing with. So, one was an idea that I started with Anthony, and I came a little bit unstuck um, timing-wise in gathering my information, so I'm not sure if I'll continue with it. And that was to do with um, supporting backpackers who come to Australia to work on farms and the um, abuse and misuse that they've experienced over the number of years because they are a critical support to the agricultural industry. And basically, if we didn't have that um, supply of labour, then the, um, certainly the fruit picking industry, I think, would collapse. Um, and then the other idea I had was around um, a disease called silicosis, which is found predominantly in stonemasons who are over the age of 65. But since the introduction of um, composite stone products such as Caesar stone, and there's a class action going through Shine Lawyers at the moment, 
Um, there's people who are very young, the youngest actually being one of my patients, because I'm a nurse, who was diagnosed at 26 with it. And he's on the transplant list for a double lung transplant. So it's had a massive impact on his life. Um, so, and that has happened because there's no regulation or um, legislation surrounding ventilation of composite stone products. They're both excellent ideas. I'm not sure what other students think, but um, I think they're excellent ideas. The, the first one is topical in terms of there have been some discussions recently about the way in which uh, backpackers should be dealt with as part of the employment regime. So I think that's an excellent choice. And the second um, provides a great opportunity to rectify an injustice in a more permanent way. So um, both great opportunities and um, the Queensland government recently changed the workplace health and safety legislation to um, introduce issues to do with industrial manslaughter. So if it is a death that's caused through the, what, what is the, and what is the condition? Silic it's called silicosis. Silicosis. Yeah, then, so you know, it, it, it dust, um, um, binding up the lungs and stopping lung function. Okay, so there's a few aspects there and, uh, and it may have some implications in terms of industrial law as well. So they're great ideas, uh, Siobhan. So thank you. Anyone I might else? discuss it with you further just to hone it in a little yes. bit. Maybe. That's fine. Okay. And again, um, I always favour an approach where we are truly collaborative. So let's, ha let's have some open discussions. And uh, I think UCRA is a good way to do that as well, if you're okay. okay with that. Yeah, thank you for that. All right, good, good. All right. Oh, yes, and Gregory says it's like the James Hardy asbestos situation. Yes, that makes sense. All right, so we've talked about the assessment regime. We talked about the textbooks. Um, what we hope to do during this unit is consolidate the skills that you learned, but now apply them in terms of statutory interpretation. You need to consider the challenge of writing material, identifying the areas, then writing the material, considering extrinsic materials and documents, and doing so at a professional level using plain English and good English grammar. So, all very simple. Uh, you need to consider the techniques surrounding statutory interpretation. That is the um, uh, techniques regarding things like retrospectivity, the boundaries of statutory authority, and the impact of charters of rights. So as you would have seen in the unit profile, the unit has three phases. Firstly, we look at the legislative process, some of the traditional methods of statutory interpretation, then we'll talk about some of the legal uh, aspects of legal writing, which is where we get into the um, uh, Ramsey textbook. And finally, we'll look at other forms of legal writing, such as wills and contracts and affidavits. So um, in terms of your assessment, you won't need the third part, but I do hope that you hang in there because I want you to really get the most out of this unit even if part of it, the third part particularly, is not directly accessible. We have some excellent PowerPoints produced in relation to this um, unit. I propose just to work my way through those with you. I'll do that now by sharing the screen. Um, before I do, are there any questions, any comments, or, or are we all good? Fine. Okay, so topic one, objectives and uh, outcomes of statutory interpretation. What we hope to do is identify intentions, objectives, underpinning and any drafting exercise, apply the relevant law, identify the most appropriate form of statute or legal document and outline some use of drafting precedents. This is part of our philosophy in trying to build something that has a practical aspect to it. And if you're working in the field of um, policy and legal d drafting, this is a highly appropriate, highly practical unit that we're dealing with. So 
What we're looking to do is consider what is involved in good drafting. And part of what we have to consider is what is the mischief? What are we trying to prevent? What are we trying to deal with here? And we've discussed some excellent ideas already tonight. So you need to think about what it is that you're trying to prevent or reduce or manage in order to come up with a good idea. A risk is a, mat, is a mischief which might occur and yet might not occur. And some examples there of the sorts of mischiefs that you might consider appropriate for consideration in your first and second assessment. A benefit is the opposite of a mischief. It's a good thing. We want more of those. So perhaps what you're looking to do is rather than deal with a mischief per se, try to maximise a benefit or support those that need support. So in some way, Siobhan's idea in terms of dealing with the backpacker workforce is a great way of maximising benefits to the farming community and fits well within that um, regime. So you need to consider the existing body of the law and work what you come up with into that body of law. The surrounding body of law might include constitutional principles. Well, I think Gregory's idea touches on that in terms of um, just compensation. International obligations might be relevant if you're particularly selecting something, say, to do with environmental law. Other aspects apply the facts to the law in the usual manner and consider precedents and pro formas but do so and take care. All right. Again, if you've worked with me in the past, you'll know that I'm not a great fan of PowerPoint. So I'm sorry to move through those PowerPoints quickly, but you have them on um, Moodle and each of the uh, PowerPoints for the week are, are included in the Moodle website. But let's um, take some opportunity just to refresh in terms of statutory interpretation principles. We know that legislative intention is different to purpose, is different to object, is different to motive. So what you need to do is, if you haven't already, prepare some form of brief overview of statutory interpretation and identify some of the key terms. Does anyone want to tell me what we mean by intention? In a sentence, what does intention mean? It's the purpose of the legislation, the reason it was created. Yes, perhaps the meaning of it, the meaning of it. Yep, um, the purpose or object, what does that relate to? So thank you for showing. Sorry, you just sound like a Dalek at the moment. Oh, you know, is it? Oh, and I've got a sign <laughs> saying that my internet connection is low. So what does purpose or object relate to? Because it's slightly different to intention. Okay, so is the purpose what you're trying to create by making the legislation? Yes, either the benefit or dealing with the mischief. Yeah. And the motive, what's that all about? And why is that different to intention or purpose or object? It's the reason behind it and why yes. it's come about. Yes, the political reasons primarily. So um, excellent answers. So. If you are struggling to have those answers immediately, have it documented in a form that you can access readily and think about standing in front of a judge who asks the question, what is the object of this legislation? What is the motive behind this legislation? What is, what is your view of the intention um, behind this legislation? In order to answer those sorts of questions, you need to understand what these things mean. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> Let's just talk for a moment about plain language drafting. Again, we're refreshing things that we talked about in statutory interpretation. Is it just me and my preference and my subjective 
idiosyncrasy that I like to talk about plain English drafting or plain language drafting? Or is there some legal support for the fact that this is an appropriate way to draft documentation and legislation? Can anyone think of anything to support an argument to say that one should draft using plain language? John, it's yes, Greg. Please. Wouldn't um, wouldn't the bodies like the Australian Law Reform Commission be supportive of all of the um, respective parliaments uh, in their drafting units um, going towards plain English now? Absolutely. Yes, I agree with that. So you can look at the way in which law reform and other bodies embrace the English language and promote the use of simple direct English. What about in statutes? Is there anything in interpretation legislation that supports the idea that it is appropriate, indeed necessary, to create legislation using plain English? Um, John, there's the reason that um, it should have its ordinary meaning. So if the ordinary meaning is confounded by um, difficult language, it's less likely to be interpreted correctly. Yes, absolutely. So that's a good idea. Have a look at Section 15AC of the Commonwealth Interpretation Act, the Acts Interpretation Act 1901. It talks about an act expressing an idea in the form of words um, which is in a clearer style than the style used in, in the past. And the legislation says that because we're using a clearer, more concise style, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're changing, the, it, doesn't, it shouldn't be taken that we're changing the meaning of the word simply because a different form of words is being used. So if we've always used a conv convoluted style of language and we now simplify it, Think about section 15AC, both in terms of an argument to say, well, it really means the same thing. But by inference, you can glean from that the intention of Parliament by introducing 15AC is let's simplify words in legislation. Let's create words in a clearer style in the future. Okay. Um, again, in the spirit of just a quick refresher, assent. What's assent and why is it important in terms of statutory interpretation? Any thoughts? So John, assent would be when um, a particular parliament has passed the bill, a bill on its third reading and it goes up to um, uh, the governor or in the case of the federal parliament, the governor general for royal assent. That is, uh, you know, to move the bill and have it signed into uh, its final detail and enact it. Excellent. Yes, it's that process of of the Crown through the Office of the uh, Governor or Ge Governor General providing assent, which is a formal acceptance of the legislation. So it's only upon that formal acceptance of the legislation by the Governor General, the assent of the Crown, that the legislation actually takes effect. And that's part of the reason why, for example, obligations imposed in international treaties and conventions don't automatically become part of our law. They need to be passed through parliament and the legislation assented, um, accepted by the uh, governor general, uh, assented to by the crown. Now we all know how to find when legislation comes into effect through assent at the Commonwealth and the state level. We know how to do that. Do I take that as a yes? Think so? Yeah. So where do you think you would look to determine when legislation actually comes into effect? Where would you, where do you check to find the date of assent, say in Queensland. So John, I'd look first of all at the bill and look at uh, possibly the front. Um, usually there's a date or a timing when it first occurred or if there's a variation. 
Yep, yep. That's it. Um, yes, Siobhan says parliamentary website documents provides the updates. You're both right. So have a look at the um, Queensland Government Office of the Queensland Parliamentary Council website. Acts as passed in a particular year. If you go to the website, you'll simply see the date of assent. Bear in mind that Section 15A of the Queensland Interpretation Act provides that the effective date of the legislation is the date of the assent, unless the Act provides otherwise. That's not quite the same at a Commonwealth level. Have a look at Section 3A of the Commonwealth Interpretation Act, um, which means that the date of the Act is effective 28 days after the date of assent. Again unless it's otherwise contained in the legislation. All right, so we need to have some brief notes about assent. We need to know about that. Now, <clears throat> because you're drafting legislation as part of this exercise, this, this unit, you need to know about drafting conventions. Can anyone tell me about drafting conventions? What do I mean by a drafting convention? It's another word for a convention, if you like. Any thoughts? Because you'll need to know drafting conventions in order to complete the exercise. How about I use this word? Yes, to... yes Siobhan? Um, is it, um, oh, I have it a second ago, drafting conventions, is it um, the they're like, almost like a regulation way of doing things. The way that you lay things out, following yes. the rules. Yes. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Not so much why you're doing it, but how you're doing it, yeah. how you lay it out. The word I, I like to think of when you say drafting t conventions, I think template. So there is a template. So when you create your legislation, you must follow the drafting conventions. You must follow the familiar template. Now that's slightly different between the Commonwealth and the, and, the, and the States. But as you would see, modern legislation takes a familiar form. That form has changed over the years. Can anyone give me an example of an, an intrinsic interpretation um, tool that was very common in the past, but we rarely see it these days? preamble. So you won't, if you're drafting legislation, I would be surprised if you choose to put in a preamble. It's just not the modern way. But you would expect legislation to follow the familiar pattern of having chapters, parts, divisions, subdivisions. Now in your exercise, given the word count, you may not be able to incorporate that and you don't have to incorporate it but it would be good to at least acknowledge that you know that modern drafting would usually require the introduction of chapters, parts, divisions, and subdivisions, and take note of that when you're looking at legislation. So select any piece of um, modern legislation and have a look at the way in which, if you like, for want of a better term, these groupings or these headings are set out and what they're called and how they're used because that's what you'll need to do. And of course, you'll be aware that if legislation changes by deleting sections or adding sections, modern protocol dictates that we don't renumber, we never renumber the sections in an act. Section 11 will always be section 11 unless it's repealed. If something's introduced between 11 and 12, it becomes 11A, doesn't it? So if you see 11A, you know that that has been introduced as a result of an amendment because it, was, it didn't start out that way. All pretty basic, we know how to do that. Okay, yes, Helen. No, just can't hear you there, Helen, sorry. We could, we could just hear you at the end. Did you have a question there?
Sorry, can you hear me now? Sorry. Okay, but I can't. I can't hear you. Oh, can we can I hear you now. Oh, we can hear you. Sorry. I'm sorry to take up everyone's time. Um, I was just reading a little bit in some of the textbook about um, there being inclusion of the words subject to used a lot in draft as a drafting te technique or a convention. So is that something that should be included in um, the, the assessment piece of the, the act that we draft? Would you like you know to see that? It, you know, it's all everything is subject to this or subject to that or. If you feel it's appropriate, absolutely. Um, and you see that um, internally, subject to chapter three of the legislation or subject to some other something else. You don't have to, but certainly that would be a good introduction or that would be a good thing to introduce into your draft legislation. So thank you, Helen, for that. Very good. All right, so not so much for the first part of the assessment, but the second assessment, you need to prepare some explanatory notes or explanatory memorandum. So let's consider explanatory notes if we're looking at it from a Queensland perspective. You know that notes relate to Queensland memorandum is, is commonal. I think that's the right way around, isn't it? So if you're looking for a guide to how to prepare explanatory notes, where do you think you'd look? Can anyone give me... There's a piece of legislation I'm interested in, and there is a resource that I think you must look at as part of this exercise. Legislation and resource about how to prepare explanatory notes. I've stumped you on that one. Yes, Helen? The Hansard? No. Is it? No. Not Hansard. It starts with H, but it's not Hansard. Not, not the one I'm thinking of. Or I'll deal with the legislation. Have a look at the Legislative Standards Act of 1922. Sorry, 1992. It's late in the day. So you'll see that it, um, Section 22 refers to explanatory notes and the fact that Explanatory notes must accompany all subordinate legislation. So have a look at the Legislative Standards Act, section 24, sets out the matters that need to be addressed in an explanatory note. So if you're preparing an explanatory note, you've got to look at that legislation. Now, in order to get a better understanding of how to draft these things, have a look at the Legislation Handbook. Now, those of you that did statutory interpretation with me would be aware that I refer to this quite often. So the legislation handbook, which is produced by the Queensland Department of the Premier and Cabinet, and in particular, have a look at part 6.11, 6.11 of the legislation handbook. That's if you're looking <clears throat> at developing something in Queensland. If you're looking at developing something at the Commonwealth and you're talking about an explanatory memoranda, then have a look at, um, uh, there's an online index to explanatory memoranda, which is produced by the Parliamentary Library. And that makes it possible for legislators and researchers to know if a memorandum has been produced. So it's a, a good way of getting some introduction into it. Now there's some excellent material prepared by Patrick O'Neill of the Law and Bills Digest section of the Parliament of Australia. See if you can find that. If you can't, let me know through you crew so we can share the information and I'll provide it. But if you find it, how about you get some kudos and share it with the class? So I like this material by Patrick O'Neill of the Law and Bills Digest section of Parliament of Australia. Okay, now some other basics, finding bills, Queensland and Commonwealth. Have a look at the parliamentary websites in both instances. Commonwealth level, have a look at the Federal Register of Legislation for bills. And OSLI also contains that information as well. You should all know how to find authorised legislation. Go to the legislation registers 
rather than OSLI for the authorised versions, but you know that. You should all know how to find second reading speeches. And you need to look at those because you've got to prepare one for yourself. So have a look at some examples. Um, who can tell me quickly where you would find a second reading speech? I think Helen would probably know this because she's already answered it, but in a different context. Hansard, okay. Um, finding second reading speeches, again, have a look at the um, Parliament of Queensland website and you should find that information quite easily. So you need to quickly be able to ascertain how do I find second reading speeches? How do I find explanatory memoranda or explanatory notes, whether it's Commonwealth or Queensland? And from that, you need to be able to find out the object of the Act find out where these sections were introduced into the legislation. All right, that's probably um, as much as I want to cover tonight. Next week, I will continue with a bit more of the basics for statutory interpretation, which is in part a refresher of what we've already done, but I'm trying to tailor it towards what it is that you need to do for your first and second assessment this term. Before I wrap up, do we have any questions, comments, or are we all good? Fine. We're all ready to go. Okay. And you know that you're going to get huge brownie points from me if you share information through Ucrew. So if you want to ask me a question, the first thing you should do is think Ucrew before you send an email. Don't worry, I'm not going to penalise you if you send me an email, but if I think it's a Ucrew question, I'll provide you with a, an answer and then I'll say, could I ask a favour, could you ask this? Re-ask it through Ucrew and I'll, I'll repeat the answer because we want to share. We're a small group. I want everyone to get HDs in this unit. I'll be the first one to go to a, um, <clears throat> a law school um, results meeting where we have to get all the results approved and argue that we should have 23 HDs. Support me in that ambition. All right. All the best. We'll see you next Tuesday. And um, thank you very much for participating. Bye then.